let's get started. So it's a while now that we are doing reinforcement learning just to get an idea of the big picture of what we are doing. We have started with Q learning and in particular deep Q learning, which was based on the Bellman equation. And then it would turn a simple, actually a reinforcement learning problem into a simple uh, regression problem using the Bellman equation. And then we continued with uh, deep Q learning. That was another algorithm. And the cool thing about deep Q learning is that you can have experience replay. So you can build a data set and uh, keep adding to that data set on the fly. And that's why they are more sample efficient. But then we said, can we use the same Bellman equation type of ideas and apply them to continuous control? Here, we needed to seek help from a deterministic policy. And it was very similar to an adversarial framework where the Q function was helping us train mu and the mu function was helping us train Q back and forth. The same way that a discriminator is going to help a generator generate images and the other way around. So it's going to be an iterative process going back and forth between those two neural networks. So you have two neural networks, and in that sense, they are similar to adversarial type of training. And then we moved more away from the Q learning, and we moved towards policy optimization last session. And then last session, we, just, we covered this paper, we covered this topic. And then one of you asked me about uh, if I can go into more details of the linear approximation to the objective and the quadratic approximation to the constraint of a trust region policy optimization algorithm. And I guess it's actually a good idea to do so. So let's try to do that before we continue. And let's cover conjugate gradient method and why do we need it. So let's remember and let's recall our TRPO objective function, which is you are trying to maximize with respect to a policy of an objective function. And this objective function is basically a local approximation to the expected cost of policy pi prime, but you are writing it in terms of its advantage over taking policy pi k. But then there is another additional constraint in TRPO. And the constraint is that the policies that you're looking for you want them to be in the neighborhood of the old policy. So you start with an old policy, you have an objective function that you want to maximize, but you don't want to deviate too much from the, par the policy that you are currently at, the one that you just found. So what we are gonna do, we are gonna use Taylor expansion, Taylor series expansion to the first order for this objective here. The parameters of pi prime, let's call them theta, the parameters of pi k are theta k. So you're up optimizing over the parameters of pi prime, which are your thetas. So you can rewrite or reformulate your objective in terms of the parameters in the parameter space. And then you can do a local approximation, linear. And this is basically the Taylor series expansion. This is the derivative of L with respect to the parameters of theta evaluated at theta k. So that's what your G is. And this term is just zero because the advantage of a policy over itself is zero. So that term is gonna drop. And then you're gonna do a quadratic approximation to your KL divergence term. This is gonna be quadratic. Again, Taylor series expansion. This term here is zero, the KL divergence of a distribution and itself is zero. So there is not much distance between the two. And then this other term is a little bit more, it's not that intuitive why this should be zero, but as you write down the definition of KL divergence, this, the first derivative of the KL divergence evaluated at theta k is gonna end up being zero as well. So that one I'm gonna leave as, as an exercise. So these two terms are zero and here you're gonna get the Hessian. Okay, linear quadratic approximation, linear to the objective and quadratic to the constraint. Okay, so far so good. Now let's rewrite stuff. This term here, we are just gonna approximate it with that linear term that we just found. The KL divergence is this other term that we came up with up there. G is the gradient of your loss 
evaluated at theta k. And remember, you are optimizing over theta. All of these terms are known. G is known, theta k is known, h is known. And h is just a Hessian. So you are taking the derivative twice. Okay, so far so good. Now let's rewrite this objective in terms of thetas and using this approximation. That's what you're gonna get. You are trying to find theta k plus, theta k plus one, but solving this optimization problem is not that hard. You can actually write down your Karish contacker conditions, basically multiply this by a lambda, put it inside your, write down your Lagrangian, take your derivatives with respect to theta, and then uh, find theta k plus one. So that one is at all is not at all hard. It's a convex optimization problem. And then that's going to give you this solution. You're going to get the inverse of h times your gradient, and then you are taking a step in that direction. So it is very similar to uh, stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent type of algorithms, but now you are taking your steps in a direction that depends on your Hessian. So this is second order. It depends on second order derivatives. So the gradient is gonna come in, the Hessian is gonna come in, and this is gonna be your learning rate, which is actually, you can find it analytically because the problem is very simple. Okay, that's gonna give you theta k plus one. But you have a problem. You don't want to compute H, let alone finding its inverse. Why don't you want to compute H? Because these are parameters. And in your parameter space, these are high dimensional stuff. You have a lot of parameters, orders of millions or trillions. If you have only, if you have a function that is taking you from your high dimensional space, which is the space of your parameters to the real numbers, it's okay. You can find the gradient very efficiently. We can do back propagation. But then if your function, like the gradient itself, that is taking you from a high dimensional space to another high dimensional space, then you need to run a for loop on all of your parameters to give you the Hessian. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to construct this matrix. And at the same time, this matrix, even if you construct it, it's gonna be the size of your parameters and inverting that is a nightmare. And you don't want to do that as well. So what's the trick? You're gonna call H inverse G to be some X. So H inverse G is some X. And then all you need to do is solve a linear system and find X. Now you can try to evaluate H X and that's gonna be efficient. Why? Because you can first compute your gradients and finding gradients is efficient. This is gonna give you a vector. And then you take that vector, transpose it, multiply it by your X. This is gonna give you a scalar. Now taking the derivative of a scalar valued function is again easy. We can do back propagation. So we can make this guy really efficient computing the forward fashion. And all you need to do is the forward pass. Why is that? This is where the conjugate gradient method is gonna come in. Rather than solving this system, h x being equal to g, you can write down an, uh, a minimization problem. So the solution to this minimization problem is gonna be the exact solution to this, opti this uh, linear system. And actually you can see that if you take the derivative and try to set it to zero, that's exactly that equation up there. Hx minus g is your residual. So the gradient of f is your residual. And at the optimum value, the gradient has to be zero. So that's why solving this problem is equivalent to solving that problem. And now you can do optimization, trying to find x. One option that you have is gradient descent, or another option is conjugate gradient, which is gonna be faster. It's gonna converge in the, the iterations that it's gonna take to converge is gonna be the size of this h maximum. Let's see, if you were supposed to do gradient descent, what would you do? You would compute the gradient of this function at some initial guess for your solution. And actually that's exactly your residual. So it's gonna be g minus h of x zero. And then if you were supposed to do gradient descent, you would set P zero to be R zero. And I'm gonna tell you why you need a new variable. Yes, they are equal now, but they're gonna become unequal when we go to the next step. And then you can take a gradient. You can take a step in the direction of your R zero or P zero. The cool thing is that you can actually find alpha zero analytically because the problem is simple. How? 
you take your x1, you plug it inside your function, and then that's going to give you a new function in terms of alpha zero. Now you take the derivative of this new function, set it to zero, and that's going to give you your step size. And this is because the problem is simple. It's quadratic. You can find your alpha zero, you plug it here, and then you can do a step in the direction of your gradient or in the opposite of the in the opposite direction of your gradient. But then the next step, again, you're gonna take your x1, you're gonna take the derivative of your function, evaluate it at x1, that's gonna give you a direction. And if you were doing gradient uh, descent, you would just descend in that direction. But it turns out that you can act smarter. You can create P1 that is orthogonal to P0. And the way that you're gonna find it is using Gramsci mean. So you are now orthogonalizing R0 and R1, and that's going to give you P1 and P0. P0 is the same as R0, but P1 is going to change. It's a smarter direction to step into. Why are they orthogonal? Just to see it intuitively, let's take P0 transpose H and multiply it by this equation on top. So it's going to be P0 transpose H R1. That's this term here. You're just copying and pasting. And then P0 transpose H P0. This term is going to cancel with that term. This term is going to cancel that term. And that's going to become zero. So they are orthogonal. And they're actually, they are called conjugate with respect to H. And this is where the name is coming in. It's coming from the P0 and P1 being conjugate. So that's your next step or the next direction. And then you take a step in that direction, in the direction of P1. The cool thing is that you can actually find alpha one, your step size. This is the optimal step size. And then you keep repeating this pattern. Then you go and compute your P2, which has to be orthogonal to both P0 and P1. And that we know how to do, Gramsci orthogonalization. So you just subtract some other terms. Visually speaking, if you were doing gradient descent, this would happen. It would take your algorithm one, two, three, four, five steps to converge. If you do conjugate gradient method, it's gonna take two steps to converge because our H in this space is two dimensional. So it's gonna take you a maximum of two steps. There is a theorem that's gonna prove that. Okay, now we know what we are doing. Linear approximation, quadratic approximation, and conjugate gradient. Is everything clear? Um, didn't you say we were gonna avoid doing the Hessian matrix because it's computationally expensive? Or in yes. Um, so so how do we do this if we can't evaluate H? So we can't evaluate our, our uh, residuals. So H, we are, you are not computing H at all. So you are not computing your Hessian. What you're doing uh, yeah. is evaluating it on a vector. Got it, okay. See? So we can, we can get the action of HS, of, of HX. We can't get, it. we don't ever write down H by itself. Yes, so you don't have to write down H by itself. You okay. just know its action on a vector. Okay. Got it, thank you. And that's because you don't want to write a for loop on the output mm -hmm. of uh, something high dimensional of a function that is high dimensional in the output space. Yeah. Basically, that's one of the reasons, actually the main reason that people have to stick to first order optimization schemes like gradient, gradient descent is because you cannot compute Hessian. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this is a smart way of actually finding its value, finding its action. It seems, yeah. um, sorry to cut you off, sorry. Yes, go ahead. It seems like the uh, momentum methods or, or like the, the other ball and chain type methods try to maybe emulate this behavior though, that conjugate gradient yes, causes. But never, or, yeah. But you never compute your Hessian, your second order derivatives because it's computationally expensive. It's unlike the first order derivatives. That's why you usually write down a loss function, which takes you from a high dimensional space to one dimension output space. Scalar valued functions, we are really good at taking their derivatives. Okay, any other questions?